Good afternoon, Kevin. Thank you for joining us today as part of our Cardiff University in Conversation series. It's, as, as the Vice Chancellor has just said, it's great to have you back in Cardiff, despite it not being um, live, unfortunately, but just in this virtual um, situation. The Welsh School of Architecture over the last, well, 40 years have been done a lot of work on sustainable buildings and sustainable housing. So we have a lot of experience in that area. Um, I mean, around the subject of sustainable housing, what is your opinion on what is a sustainable home? <laughs> Thanks, Joe. Well, well, first of all, before I answer that question, um, it's a great honour to be taking part today. And I'm sorry also that it's not virtual because I enjoy coming to Cardiff and, and it's, um, I just, uh, Colin so, so generously mentioned, um, I, I, I was awarded a, an honorary um, fellowship um, at the same time as my son was granted his uh, MA and that was, uh, or MSc I should say, um, uh, in architecture. And, and uh, so it's, um, yeah, I have particular fond memories of Cardiff and, um, and, and it would have been great to be there. But anyway, never mind, I'm, I'm at home. And um, so, uh, thank you both. Um, and to answer that question, I don't think there's any such thing as a sustainable home in as much as, um, and I've said for a long time, that you can build the most ecological building out of doglick and leaves uh, and, and you can put the most sustainable forms of heating in it and you can enter whatever, you, you, know, you can create a passive house. But the standard British method for governing our domestic built environments is to move straight into a house, turn the heating up to full and then control the temperature by opening the windows. In other words, it's got nothing to do with the building and it's got everything to do with our behavior. Uh, and it's a behavior which we cannot hope um, to affect at an individual level or even at a family level, but it's behavior which I, can, I, I believe can only begin to make an effect at a community level, to a neighborhood level, at a city-wide level. And it's only then with critical mass do you actually achieve meaningful results. And in my work in development, um, we of course focused on the energy performance of buildings and indeed tried to make buildings as meager as possible in terms of their resource use, but also their, their performance. Um, but we've really looked at um, the public realm, at the spaces in between buildings where people meet. and. It, because it's in the public realm, much more so than in the individual home, that we as uh, households can share much more in the way of resources. So, um, you know, of course, we can design buildings to be um, beautiful, to be flexible, to be, you know, uh, customised to individual needs, uh, meaning that people can live as efficiently as possible in them. Um, we can design them to be thermally efficient. We can do all of this. But when you get outside the building, at that point, suddenly that that's where the kind of the, the, the world takes over and so uh, on the schemes i've been involved with we put in things like uh, car clubs electric bike clubs uh, allotments um food growing opportunities car parks which are also orchards uh, shared amenity space play space for children uh, stuff which is a resource which if you were to have it in your own home would cost you as an individual household much more. Uh, it, you know, the object being that if, if you live on one of our schemes, it, it meant that you would um, not have to have three cars or two cars, or maybe even a car at all, because you could use the car club. Um, mm. and, and to share vegetable grain, to share food grain, to share amenity, to share these things means a, a natural reduction resource. I once took a hot air balloon ride over Somerset and I was astonished to see that not only did every house I flew over have a, a garden in which there was a shed, there was also a trampoline. And it just always occurred to me that if you could somehow encourage every household in Britain to tear down their garden walls uh, and, and make communal gardens, that you, you'd only need one shed. You'd only need maybe two lawnmowers. You, <laughs> but you'd only need one trampoline and one sandpit. And um, uh, I have never really got very far with this idea because we all, we all like the idea of that sort of territorial ownership. But I remember a fantastic um, statistic, and I'm digressing now, from um, by a regional ooh, 20 years ago now, was, which was that the, the average power tool, and we all own several in our households, the average power tool in its entire life is used for four minutes. Wow. So if we can begin to share 
when you think about it, actually cars probably are used for what? To, the average car might be used for two hours a day, one hour a day, and one ten percent of its time. So if we can try and share the resources that we have in our public realm to such an extent that they're getting used much more, then we begin to really make a difference. Now, I'm not suggesting for a moment that we should start living as people do in parts of India in one room of a house altogether and share our households with five other families. But it, it, what, we're, what we're trying to achieve when we talk about sustainability is making sure that seven billion people currently on the planet, seven and a half, can get along and get on with the resources that we have in such a way that there is enough left for the next generation. So talking about solar panels is only part of the question. Sure. And how do you think the planning process could adapt to support that sustainable housing to sustainable community scale developments? Because obviously that is kind of critical to happen, to make things happen in that community level. And what can we learn from other countries along those sorts of lines to promote that community living approach? Well, it's rather sad, isn't it, that we don't need to look to other countries, that we can actually look to our own history almost. Um, I remember that when the Labour government, the last Labour government, introduced um, the intent incentive scheme for um, manufacturers of solar panels, that, um, that that led to a fantastic uh, investment in that industry, which has directly led to the, to the reduction in price of those products. Just talking about solar panels there. Um, having said that, it's not all about solar panels. But the the uh, the interesting thing is that Gordon Brown's 2016 target for zero carbon in construction that was a very very clear target, which was long term, which gave industry really clear directions, and it meant that many many companies tooled up and started to focus. And what the private sector really needs is strong direction, not necessarily incentives. It doesn't need cash handouts. What it needs is government policy, which says in 10 years time, you want to be here. Therefore, feel safe that you can invest in a strategy, a business strategy, which delivers this. And people suddenly get interested because they can see a market 10 years hence that they can work towards. Mm -hmm. Now, Robert Jenrick has recently announced that by 2025, he wants new housing. I love the way that this is sort of continually parenthesized. He wants all new housing to be not zero carbon, but to have low carbon heating, which sounds like the most, at first sight, the most aggressive kind of exciting ambition. But when you read between the lines, what, what, what you're really saying is, well, by that time, the grid will be partly decarbonized. So probably a developer can get away saying, well, we'll just put in a gas boiler and you know commit to buying 5% from a biomass gas gasification plant um in other words it doesn't solve anything and actually we're technologically we're at a point where we ought to be uh, capable of delivering um not only zero carbon homes but carbons which are net energy positive in other words which thanks to solar power can generate more energy than they consume over the course of a year and i think that's a far more ambitious target and if we were to set that and say okay let's not say 2025 because it's four years hence let's say 2028 Actually, that's a, that's a really meaningful target for new homes. And, and I think you've got to also, every time you, you, you come across one of these kind of rather simpering, watered down government, sorry, I shouldn't be so critical, um, uh, targets that, that actually, when you set an ambitious target, you're not just setting it to the supply chain, you're setting it to the consumer market as well. So when people move into a home, and discover that they have zero energy bills, that they can actually make money from their house, uh, all of a sudden, their personal balance sheet every year looks so much better. They, they've got money to spend on beer and holidays, you know, if we can all get out and spend it on beer and holidays. But we, you know, th there is, for the consumer, a tremendous excitement about, about this and, and, uh, and every, eco scheme I've ever come across, which is selling high quality, beautifully built, super sustainable housing, is always oversubscribed. They can't sell enough of them. So uh, it suggests to me that we have a, um, a lack of political 
ambition in this and a timidity in terms of a, um, a readiness to comply to the demands of the, of the major players in the construction industry. Mm -hmm. Sure. No, I mean, I, one part of the research that we've done at the Welsh School of Architecture is to build a prototype or a, a demonstration energy positive house, the Salsa House, which is located near Bridgend. Um, we finished, we built that five years ago and it's been proven, the, our research has proved that it is energy positive over a year, which is great. Um, but the, and the Welsh Government have sort of used that as, a, as an example in their sort of Process, progress going forward with this. So they've actually funded the innovative housing program of new builds where they're funding over, well, nearly 2,000 new built housing across Wales. Yeah. Um, and some of those houses are built are designed around the energy positive affordable house that we did build. So it, there is progress being made. It's just a lot slower than we would, we would like really, but it's, it's still happening, which is great. Um, how do you feel that the construction sector needs to change to really support this, you know, what's the role that the construction sector can play in this change going forwards? Thank you. Uh, well, that's a, that's a really interesting question. Uh, before I answer that, I just want to say, I'm, I'm, my viewpoint is, is I, I live over the border, the other side of the, the seven in the West Country. So when, when I talk about national policy, I'm looking to London and despairing. Um, of course, Wales, and I should add, this is very important, that Wales have for 10 years led Britain in terms of the, um, the proactive policies to, um, to, to, to build sustainably. And, you know, I applaud that because, um, you know, we, 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 should, we should all be following Wales's example. And, and, um, and, and I think, you know, actually ever since the, the Welsh Assembly came into being, you know, it, it took a very, very proactive, very, um, very aggressive um, stance towards sustainability and, and, and has championed it. And, you know, we've, I've, I've filmed one or two really exciting projects in Wales and, and, and been involved with them. And, um, and, you know, not least the Lammers project, which is, is kind of very hardcore, you know, um, self-sustaining, mixture of permaculture and sustainability. But, you know, why not, um, why not set the, the, the bar incredibly high for the exemplars, which is, is what you've been doing and, and 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 actually then as you say seeing it rolled out i mean two thousand homes across wales is not insignificant no and i think the important thing is that other people need to learn from those developments regardless of whether they're the lamas in eco village or whether they're something that's just trying a few new technologies but if we can all learn from those experiences that you, whether it's good learnings or bad learnings it's really important to help things progress into in the future so yeah, absolutely, absolutely. I'm, I'm curious to know whether what 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 are the kind of what's the big takeaway for you from those projects that you think is 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 little appreciated or not known. I think it's the effort, the amount of effort that, and I think I've seen you know on grand designs, it's the same. It's the commitment, it's the effort by the people involved in the project who really want it to happen, and I think you have to have those that level of commitment to make things happen and it can be hard along the way you know you come across problems that you wouldn't expect but I think all of the projects that we've worked on whether they're retrofits or the new builds people are always really proud of what they've achieved at the end and the, the positive results that we get with re massively reduced energy bills for the occupants improvements in comfort all of those things really people feel proud and can see what they've, what, what, why they've done what they've done. And they're really prepared to take those experiences and learnings on into their future roles, whatever they're doing. So it's, it's really exciting. Yeah, and it, it is, I think um, so often we find this either with private owners of, of, of homes or, or self builders, or people who've simply been on the social housing list and who are social uh, housing tenants actually living in a, a home and living in a community where, where suddenly you have this opportunity to re reduce your, your, your outgoings and, and live in a, in a really comfortable ventilated home and have actually all this extra stuff in your life, you know, which is amenity, which helps you live, you know, which makes life easier, um, if anything. Um, it's incredibly empowering for people. They get very excited by it and, and fit in. And, and, uh, I, I, the idea that somehow you have to be a new occupier to 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 fully kind of benefit from sus sustainable housing, you know, is is not the case at all. And I have to say, of course, that the one sector which has been more, far more um, 
ambitious in terms of building sustainably is, is the social housing sector. Mm -hmm. Because the social housing landlords, the housing associations, when they build, they, they, they realize that if they can make people, if they can assist in people living a more resilient life, their costs of living are lower. So consequently, their tenants will pay their rent uh, as you know, because their energy bills are so much lower. Um, and so everybody wins, you know, uh, the, the landlord gets the rent, the place gets looked after, people feel a sense of ownership and, and common commitment to a project, um, and people live uh, and collectively save carbon, save resource. And I think that's it's 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 interesting that the projects that keep winning the awards are always the social housing schemes, not the big private developer schemes. But um, but to come on to your question, um, I'm sort of going to skirt it and go straight to the source of the problem in my, my view, which is that we have in Britain a culture in construction, um, which is a culture which is generally, it's been kind of, um, it's been eaten into since, the, since actually the 1960s. Uh, I'm very mindful that I think that the year in which Britain built the largest number of social housing was 1953. It was after the war, and it was under a conservative government, surprisingly, and it's never been beaten, that number, and it, it occurred in a time in the 50s and 60s, and I remember this because my, my parents um, had friends who were living on, you know, in, in, as renting social housing. It, 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 it occurred in a time when if you, when there was a big social housing scheme going up, council housing, you could opt in, opt out. And it, it, it wasn't considered um, a stigma to live in social housing. It was actually something, you know, you made a sort of lifestyle choice about whether you were gonna buy somewhere or whether you're gonna privately rent or whether you're gonna rent from the council. And it was, it was nothing to do with, with class or background. There was no sense of social division, as it were. Um, or what he said there was, it was, it was far less uh, entrenched than it is now. And um, so I think culturally we've moved from that to through the 70s and 80s to a position where suddenly privatization of your home and being able to sell it on as an asset and make money became actually a key part of property ownership. Um, to a point where um, uh, now everybody, but very specifically a significant number of land businesses um, take sites, sell them on, a developer might buy that site sell it on, make some more money. And eventually the poor house builder who, you know, has got to sell into the market at an affordable level is squeezed so much, they can't, the actual builder can't make money on constructing the homes. And so it has to build small and cheap with, it has to be said, a, a, a labor force, which is generally not that brilliantly trained because we haven't trained people in the UK properly since the last century and has recently been very reliant on imported labor, of course. And so what you end up with, um, and what we've ended up with, is a kind of slow, um, um, what you would call decaying of the market, down to six major house builders, all of whom are land banking and land owning and making the most of their money from, from actually developing and turning land in terms of its value, increasing its value with permissions and so forth. And, um, and it's in complete comparison to the rest of Europe, where, for example, in Germany, uh, land is actually allocated by states, and therefore there isn't the same chance to mark up land. They, Germans can build houses bigger and cheaper than we have. So their houses are, are larger, but they cost less uh, because of the fact that they don't have this rather caustic and very corrosive um, uh, uh, habit of, of, of turning the value of land on the way through without actually doing anything to it. And um, in Austria, for example, something like 82% of all new homes are self-built or custom-built, relying on literally thousands of small building companies. So they have a culture, not of six giants, but of many, many um, diverse businesses. And it's the same in, in Holland as well. So um, we, we, we have culturally this problem that um, essentially we, we you know, and, and the National uh, Custom and self Build Association and uh, many other organizations and in my little way with Grand Designs and with the, the street program, which we've been filming in Bicester about custom build. And we keep trying to change this culture, you know. Our, our self build and custom build numbers hover around eight, 
-hmm. of our entire market. And wouldn't it be great if we could get that up to, 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 to uh, well, even to just the level of the Netherlands, which is something like 60%. So um, if, if we could create more diversity and more competition and encourage more SMEs and actually get rid of this very destructive uh, process of marking up land on the way through, then I, I believe if, if, uh, if we could get there, then that would help enormously. It does require national and local governments to say, um, well, we're going to distribute land like the Germans do. And we're going to distribute it every year at a fixed rate. And um, I suspect that's not going to happen. We have a culture which is so deeply rooted in the in open market principles that um, I, I doubt we'll ever get there. And I, I mean, I, I think that, I mean, everybody might dream of being a self builder. I mean, it sounds great, but obviously it needs a lot of dedication and commitment. And I mean, and people don't have the resources, the financial resources, they or they feel they don't have the financial resources to, to build their own home. How do you think that the people could be you know, the general population could be helped to either be informed as to how they could do that. Because I mean, I think that might be a big barrier. Is that it's just something that's unachievable for me, really? So yeah, yeah. No, I'm, all of us look at that. You know, don't we? And think I, it's very exciting to watch. <laughs> you know, and I think to an extent, the series of the television series has been the success of it has been um, down to that fact that it, it, it's sort of something which we think is reachable, but which we have to come, you know, push come to shove we wouldn't all do it. Um, so th that's why we made this series in Bicester uh, in Oxfordshire about the community that's happening at Graven Hill, where the local council uh, went on a trip to uh, look at a big self-built custom built scheme in uh, Holland called Almira, just outside um, uh, Amsterdam, where a thousand homes are being built uh, and they're all owner occupier, or, or some of them are social rental, but they're all they're all um, as it were they're all custom or, or, or self built. They're built by individuals and families and households rather than built by um, a developer. And I was on that trip. I went um, and um, and lots of local government people went, uh, but Bista, the local uh, the local authority there, Cherwell District Council, they were the only district council to actually do something about it. And they, they spent five years negotiating with the MOD to buy an old military site and they got it in the end and it's a slow handover, it's still being handed over. And we filmed the first 10 pioneers who were really proper self-builders. There's no doubt that they were like watching 10 episodes of Grand Designs all on the same site, you know. Um, but what's exciting now is that we're back um, and we're filming another two series. So we're filming another 20 households or so but these are people who are mainly custom building. So they're buying a product from a company. Mm -hmm. And then they, you know, and, the, and there are now a couple of show houses actually at Graven Hill. And I have to say the companies are not British, mainly they're from Poland and Germany and Austria and so on. Um, but um, the people are able to, as it were, look at a building and say, well, I, I like that room, I like that wallpaper, I like those taps. And, and, and work with the sales guys and the, the company's architect to, to sort of customize a home. So it's. The, the homes sort of look, they, they, you can see the family resemblances between the, 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 you know, that same houses by the same brand, but actually they're different homes and they're organized around the needs and the particular requirements of households. What you get because of the customer involvement, the customer journey on the way through, is you get a home which is much better built, it tends to be prefabricated, factory built, often in Germany or Poland, um, some of, some of the systems involve uh, concrete and insulated formwork, you know, like uh, the uh, Beco system. Uh, but what you get is an amazingly well-built house that's nearly usually airtight, nearly usually passive, very low energy build. So automatically, um, this route seems to deliver far more sustainable construction. And what I like about it is that, you know, here's Grand Designs and we know these people are all mad and that they're right there on the margins of society doing their things with, you know, um, thermal salt storage systems and self-heating houses and you know, whatever it is. And, and that's great because we need the experimentalists. We, you know, your project, we needed solstice. You needed that before you could even roll out anything else. 
And then you get the innovators who follow. And the innovators are your, you know, your 10 houses you did afterwards. And the innovators, what they do is they pick the best of the technologies that are proven. They, they pick the approved you know, um, uh, systems and the approved construction methods. In other words, what they're doing is building far more safely, but they're taking the best of what the experimenters are mucking about with. Um, and Graven Hill, for me, is one of those. It's, it's, it's not defined by the word experiment, but by the word innovation. Mm -hmm. And that's really interesting, because you can demonstrate that you can do it at scale. Now, the sad news is that there aren't that many other local authorities who are picking up the mantle yet and doing more. There's, there's a, a whiff of something happening in the Northwest and Glasgow are already actually doing small pockets self build uh, and custom build schemes across their, their, the entire city. So that's good, but we need a lot more of that. Uh, and it, during that, you mentioned quite a few times that we've always got to look to Europe for the supply chain. Yeah. Um, and it would, I mean, it, ideally, we would be buying these things from the UK, from people in, and companies in this country. Yeah. Do you think, how do you think we can um, make, help that to happen more quickly and the, for the quality to really step up to be where we need it to be? Uh, does it, do we need sort of grants? Do you think things like the Green Homes Grant and the um, feed-in tariff and renewable heat incentive helped towards that or do, is it too stop start you know is it, it how can we really help our supply chains to progress thank you um well i think that's an interesting question the if you refer back to the renewable heat incentive and the um feed-in tariff and all of the grants that have been available to say over the last 10-15 years um and even for example the green deal which was a retrofitting scheme, which felt mm. I was involved with that. It felt absolutely flat on its face after two years of work. Um, and that was a loan scheme. Um, you know, the point about all of these is that they are specific and that they are not very well joined up and that you, we haven't seen from central government a kind of committed set of policies which seem coherent. Mm -hmm. we, look, we've had uh, Robert Jenrick this summer will have been in the post for two years and he'll have been the third housing minister to sit in that post at the top of DCLG, um, uh, the, the third in 12 years or so, who's actually occupied that position for two years. We've had 10 ministers in 10 years occupying that position. So what's the chance for any joined up thinking there? Zero. Mm -hmm. um, and, you know, I, 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 I kind of think the, the, the only way you're going to get where you need to be is by prescribing and um, adopting a kind of almost like a, a holistic approach in the way that the UN has done with its 17 sustainability goals. Mm -hmm. And once you set the goals, everything has to conform. Everything has to comply with that to simply, you know, respond to the market and respond to market consultation. That's a phrase I really dread because it, what that means is they've gone out and they've talked to some major developers and the major developers have all said no. Um, and um, I have to say this is changing by the way, because there are people like Lendlease who are doing amazing things in sustainability. And, and, and an old friend of mine, Paul King is director of sustainability there. And he, he, um, he has been one of the great good guys in, uh, uh, ecological and sustainable construction for the past 20 years and, and he was a great inspiration to me so I think you know there are there are good signs and, and Lendlease are one of these companies who are committing to zero carbon and you kind of think well that's wonderful but they, they're actually doing it almost without without government support you know um, meanwhile we have a we have our you know our zero carbon target of, what, is it 2050 doesn't really matter does it yeah. I'm, I'm probably not going to be here for a start I mean, I'll be 90 odd or something, you know, um, and, 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 it, and certainly nobody in government currently is going to be in government then. That's a very important point. Mm -hmm. um, sorry, now I forgot the question because I've, <laughs> I've, I've gone political again. But um, essentially, um, go on, let's, let's pick it up. <laughs> no, it was about, I mean, it was about the supply. You know, again, it was turning back to supply, oh, yeah, supply and chain, coming back yeah. to the UK and how we can make the UK a stronger player in the market. Yeah, um, so I, I come back to this point, that we haven't had the joined up thinking, therefore we haven't had the kind of the market response. So again, I mean, if government said, look, 
2035, every new home is going to have to be off-site manufactured, or it's going to have to be modern methods of construction, or whatever it is. Then there's a target, and industry would say, right, let's tool up. So what we have got, we've got LNG, Legal and General, who had some phenomenal amount of money to invest in construction design. It was in the billions, and they they built a new su uh, supply chain factory with its own DHL delivery um, depot in it to produce off-site manufactured homes. Mm -hmm. And they've been working on this for five years, perhaps now, and it's not quite delivering anything like the numbers it should be. And, um, and then you've got people like Urban Splash who actually are committing to building using a Japanese company they partnered with to, to, to build factories in the UK. But, you know, we're talking here about a relatively, you know, middle, medium sized developer constructor who's really out there doing, you know, high quality stuff, hugely inspirational business. Um, uh, but they're doing it, you know, they, they're doing it because they believe in it, because they think there's a fantastic opportunity, not because there's any government drive to deliver against you know, uh, against objectives. So I, I think um, it all comes down, I, I think it does come down to the role of government, which is to set the targets and to set ambitious targets and the supply chain, the market will follow. Mm. And, um, and that's really, I suspect, why we haven't got the same culture that exists, for example, in Germany, Austria, across Europe. Sure, great. Um, and then, I mean, going back to your initial sort of um, statements about the public public realm and the importance of community. How do you think the impact of COVID will? Do, do you think the the COVID long term impact on our lifestyles and the way we live will change as a result of COVID? And is is this likely to be a positive impact because of the opportunities that have happened that we might not have foreseen before? Yeah, I don't know what you think about this, but it's. Got, I talk to people and sort of suggest optimistically that, you know, this might be a great opportunity for a change in lifestyle and culture in a more sustainable way of living and working. And, and I've got some cynical friends who just say, yeah, but you just watch, you know, because the moment we get a cure, the moment we all get vaccinated, it'll just be back to normal. Everything will go back to normal. Um, the offices will fill up again, you know, the villages will become abandoned and just return to being dormitories. Um, yeah. And all the shops will open it'll be crazy all over again um so we don't know do we but one thing i suspect that will remain will be this because we've all learned how to work remotely those of us who can uh, and the and even study remotely um i'm not suggesting that is the future at all what i'm suggesting is that that remote learning and remote work will play a part so just as some lucky people manage pre-covid to you know not go to the office on fridays or do a you know, three-day a week commute so i think that will become very normal and i think actually much more flexible working hours in the office will become much more normal um the banks um the major city institutions will adopt much more flexible attitudes, there's no doubt, because they've had to during COVID and they've discovered they can still make money and still operate with much reduced overhead to much smaller floor plates in their office blocks. Um, so I think that's, well, what that means as a corollary is that that suggests that within local communities, on your high street in your suburb or in a village, you're going to see a, uh, an increased demand from all kinds of people who are working from home two days a week uh, for the post office to remain there, for the shop to stay open, for the pub to stay open, because there's a place to meet, there's a place to, uh, there's a resource there in terms of, you know, office supplies and posting and so forth that's really important to them and, and it's com com comfortable and easy. And I suspect within suburbs you'll see uh, shops that have closed, uh, some of them converted to uh, to um, live work, you know, uh, whatever they're called, um, you know, hub arrangements where you can go and drink coffee and sit on your laptop. Oh, it's called Starbucks, isn't it? That, I forgot. <laughs> um, but, uh, you know, that, that the idea that, you know, that there are places where you can go and work, where there might be a photocopier and a, and a, a central, you know, reception system, a meeting room maybe. And they, these facilities exist in every city, just that they tend not to have been used by the vast majority of people, but by small businesses and freelancers. So I think we're going to see a lot more of that. And what does that mean? That means that essentially people are going to become much more interested in their communities 
And I think probably invest more time and energy and a bit of money in that community to keep it going. You know, the big businessman on the hill might say, do you know what, I'm going to put in a massive satellite system to bring fiber broadband to my house. And while I'm at it, I think the entire village should have it. You know, that's my dream. Um, and, and you'll find people using their cars less, needing fewer cars to own. You might even find a, a car club actually emerging in a village community where, you, you know, literally two years ago, you couldn't have ever imagined that happening. So you, I, I suspect in my perfect dream that um, <laughs> what I'll see is um, people coming together more, doing more together, sharing their resources more and actually be, c making much more resilient communities. So we move away from the dormitory idea to, mm -hmm. to places that actually are places where people want to live, want to invest their time, want to invest their energies which is more sustainable, which is great. Yeah, 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 absolutely. It really fits. And people talk about sustainability as though it's about, um, it, as though it is about solar panels and heating and, you know, buying an electric car when it's actually just a bit of it. And a sustainable economy has to be measured in, in three ways, in economically, environmentally. And, and that isn't just about carbon. It's about resources and it's about biodiversity and it's about uh, clean air and it's you know, loads of things. But it has to be measured also socially and, and having, um, and, and it's just, we're just beginning to create the metrics for social sustainability late, late out of the blocks here because um, it's the way whereby we can measure and identify where communities and neighborhoods are resilient and, res you know, and where we, we think that they're effectively future-proofing themselves. Mm -hmm. So I think it's, um, it's an important, very important thing that we, we accommodate and, and remember that sustainability isn't just about, just about government 2050 zero carbon targets. Mm -hmm. No, it's about the, well, it's about here and now, but it's also about the future populations as well. And we need to be thinking about a lot, a lot more, a lot more across all three of those, those um, strands of sustainability. So um, yeah, actually you've reminded me that that is the, that's the 1984 agreement. It's the Brundtland agreement which I can't quite remember the wording for because it's so long ago, but it's, it's about the resources of uh, meeting needs. It's about, isn't it? About yeah. Society being able to meet its needs currently while also allowing for future generations to meet theirs. It's yeah. that simple. Yeah. Mm -hmm. yeah. Great. Well, I hate to interrupt because it's such a fascinating discussion, which, which it is, but uh, it's just a, a chance to put some of the questions we've had through on the chat and some of them uh, pre-submitted and but there was one quite interesting one. Somebody on the webinar, Kevin, asked, how are you, Kevin? <laughs> I'm fine, thanks. I'm, <laughs> okay, good. I'm, 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 I'm in my 60s. I'm asthmatic. I've been uh, very careful in lockdown. Um, I miss seeing my family. And um, I'm, uh, but I'm, well, and I, I have been filming, albeit uh, driving around the country in a camper van um, in order to do so, which is not fun in the winter. And... Um, uh, and keeping up sort of four meters social distancing now from all of our uh, all of the people I'm interviewing. So it's a kind of very odd world, and and certainly, um, like many of us, I think we we you know the, the sort of sense of privation is um, it, it gives us all an opportunity to reflect and an opportunity to consider what matters in life. And I think that if if there's one thing, one one positive thing to come out of this terrible time, and all of these these deaths and 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 illness. Um, is that opportunity to, 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 to think and reflect and, and think about what, what matters to us, you know, what, what, what is of value to us. Absolutely. Uh, and let's hope we're on the final stretch now before we get through at least the worst of all of this. Um, so, so one uh, theme that keeps coming through in the questions is, is retrofitting, and it sort of links to a, a whole range of things. Uh, somebody referenced... Um, uh, clearly, clear the 2050 uh, zero carbon and 90% of the stock that's available then is, is already built. Um, somebody talked about uh, the high street um, and, and the dramatic acceleration of the decline of the high street, which COVID has, has, has brought about. Uh, and, and, and will that give the opportunity for sort of live work developments or, or what the opportunity is there? Um, so, so what are your thoughts on, on that? Well, first of all, as regards the high street and as regards business, of course, everybody tells me that that uh, what's happening in business uh, uh, is sort of what everybody thought would happen. But it's instead of taking 10 years, it happened in one. 
So the decline of the high street of certain retail sectors has, you know, accelerated. De Debenhams went bust, if you like, faster than anybody thought would be possible. Um, so I think change is afoot and it's going to continue. It's not going to all of it going to reverse. Um, and of course, there are going to be lots of teeth missing from our high streets um, as small businesses go under. And, and they're just a huge tragedy. <coughs> Excuse me. Um, as ever, you know, you look at the the cost of achieving a 2050 zero carbon goal and no, no government is going to commit to the trillions of pounds required to do that in five years and they everybody in government hopes that it'll be amortized and it will continue to be amortized by successive governments of whatever color um, in order to achieve it um, the as I, I mentioned earlier talking to Joe the the campaign, I think it was in 2010, called the Green Deal to retrofit the existing stock of housing. And, and your, your questioner is absolutely right. Um, you know, the vast majority of 93% or something of, of housing uh, that's going to be here in 2050 already exists. So how do we retrofit it? Um, there's been a great deal, a great deal of science done around that, um, that time, in the, about 10 years ago. Um, from all kinds of organizations, uh, including the Royal Institute of Chartered Surveyors, Engineers, um, the Society for Protection of Ancient Buildings, lots of historical bodies did some really important scientific research in terms of building energy performance, um, air quality, breathability of materials, uh, the suitability of retrofitting techniques to different housing stocks and types. There was a government um, scheme to train up an army of uh, surveyors who would be able to prescribe the exact solution for a particular house. It was all going to go incredibly well. Um, the indus industry had actually spent a fortune tooling up because the government had set targets at that point, and and all these companies had started retrofitting companies, businesses just started up. Some of them very big. It relied on a complex loan scheme from government to individual households, which apparently didn't wouldn't affect their mortgages, but many households felt would, um, and. As a result of the complexities, perhaps, the, the scheme had an almost zero uptake. I mean, it was the most spectacular failure. And it demonstrated just how, despite getting an entire infrastructure ready across the board, you know, which for once the government kind of did to what was then DEC, Department of Energy and Climate Change, no longer exists, possibly as a result of the failure of this scheme. Um, it, despite that, it was the it was actually a misjudgment about the complexity of the offer to the consumer in the end which did for the scheme um that's my view i mean others may disagree but the um it goes to show that whatever you do you have to make it simple in terms of what people feel they're getting out of it mm -hmm. and it would have been probably cheaper simply for government to pay for it in the end as we've discovered actually now in COVID, it's often yeah. simpler for the government to do that. Yeah. Um, so there's, there's a number of questions of the uh, nature of advice. What would your advice be to? Um, and I, I have a, a, a 22 year old with an economics degree that wants to design and build their own house um, or undergraduate architects. What, what advice would you give to them? Um, Aspiring grand designers. Also, we have that too. You, you must be. Yeah. Asking. Do you know? I'm. I'm. I'm not sure that I can offer much. In. I know my observation. I don't know about you, Colin, but my observation is that that you know there's a generation of people, our age and above, which, which is which, which actually, who feel quite alarmed and saddened by the destruction that we see in the world, and there's a generation of people, in their teens and twenties who are going to inherit the mess and and um i i don't feel that i could offer advice i feel i should be offering an apology because i you know it's getting out of this mess is 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 highly complex and the only thing i feel strongly about is 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 the um commitment that i think we all should be making to somehow fight climate change and fight resource over use and um, exploitation and and fight actually for that matter um the the exploitation of human beings and uh, and um 
and there are many people, of course, who don't have the time or the resources or the energy to do that, who are too busy trying to homeschool at the moment or, or, or actually stave off um, unemployment or, or cope with being furloughed. So, um, but I think um, in the end, the best inspiration is to look at Greta. Mm. And I say that because, not because she travels the world addressing governments, um, but because she decided to engage in civil disobedience. So she bunked off school one day a week and sat outside the local government offices and protested. And I kind of think, actually, that's, that's what we should, if we can, all be doing. Jonathan Porritt wrote a very interesting book published this year called Hope in Hell, in which he says, you know, he thought we had the last chance 10 years ago, but actually, you know, he's saying, you know, we, 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 we passed the point of last chance, but we can at least still act. And the only way it's going to work is by mitigating carbon emissions, by sequestering carbon. In other words, huge international projects to replant forests and create carbon sinks. And his third point, which I find really interesting, is civil disobedience. That actually, if we feel strongly about, enough about something, it isn't good enough to sit, as I've done all my life at the breakfast table, tutting about what I'm reading in the paper. You, you actually have to get out there and do something. So I'm, I'm, I'm struggling at the moment. Now I appreciate if you're 20, you can't do this. You've got enough to do with your life. Maybe unless you feel very strongly, I don't know. Maybe you, you have. I said, as I say, if you're homeschooling, there's no way. But you get to my age and you think, actually, now's the time, you know. Civil disobedience. Yeah, ab absolutely. There's quite an interesting one here because it raises all kinds of uh, new questions given what we've been talking about. You've seen so many amazing houses around the world, but if you could choose anywhere to build, where would it be? Uh, and of course, these days, we don't really get around the world very much, so maybe we won't so much in the future. It'd be interesting to hear your thoughts, though. Yeah, yeah, two questions I get asked are exactly that one. The other question is, if you could build anything, what would you build? And the answer is, well, they're completely sort of interdependent. I mean, it, you don't know what you're going to build till you arrive at the site. And then you understand which way it faces and what the weather is, what the altitude is, whether the wind blows from the east or the south, um, what the ground conditions are like. Is it in a woodland? Is it on a hill? Is it in a desert? You know, is it in northern Scotland or on the south coast in, you know, of Cornwall in, in balmy spring-like weather? Look, it's, it, it's entirely contextual. And I think, um, where would you build? Well, you know, that phrase is also exigent upon other things in life, isn't it? I'd love to build. I'd love to build on a cliff in Greece, but I'm never going to because I've got to work. <laughs> As if we all. So it's kind of there's a, there's a, there are other things in life which determine these cho these choices, which is in a way why after 20 years or 25 years of making grand designs, um, I'm still making it because we still get projects through because everybody's different. So on slightly similar lines, but more particular than speculative, how sustainable is your home and have you ever done a self-build? Um, well, I, I've long ago realised that it's very important that I don't uh, talk too much or reveal the nature of my own home uh, in order to uh, preserve my reputation, otherwise it's trashed. Um, I have self-built, I have um, partially self-built. Um, and I've restored a lot of old buildings. And indeed, I did um, take a, a listed grade two building to sort of zero carbon um, as an experiment. It was so experimental that I, I was very loath to talk about it because, I, I, you know, the retrofitting of, of, of historic buildings is so complex and requires so many um, interventions that are so particular to that building and so particular to the context of a, where a beam sits or whatever it is, um, that um, it's, it's important not to draw too many conclusions. But um, yeah, I've experimented with um, uh, secondary glazing, um, uh, secondary double glazing to create triple glazing in line with internal insulation and mitigate and, and sort of ways of mitigating um, uh, cold um, uh, bridging through walls, which is really complicated and I won't go into it's too boring but but um for me it, it, it's been a sort of fascinating journey and I I um I I'm I'm, I'm kind of I, I I thought I might you know do it one more time we'll see you know I mean re re retirement beckons eventually 
only because you know things stop working and you, know, you have to sort of slow down. Um, so I'm I'm kind of thinking maybe maybe uh, one one more go. You know, one more go. Yeah, just just on a broader scale, and I, I'm not sure what this question is about, but I assume you are. Um, do you think the 15 minute city is achievable for the majority of cities in the UK? And if so, will it realistically lead to a significant reduction in carbon output? The 15, 15 minute, minute city. I presume this refers to the um, the idea of finding everything within a 15 minute range of where you live so that you, you know, the city becomes walkable, it becomes cyclable, it becomes, um, and, and, and look, you have, you, know, you go to Berlin, the parts of Berlin where they've done it. So it is achievable. Um, one of the most exciting exemplar towns is Freiburg in Germany, which has the most extraordinary green quarter and uh, integrated transport system. And um, it's lovely. I've got a photograph somewhere of a, of, a, of a bicycle next to an electric car, next to a bus, next to a tram. And it's a photograph taken in Freiburg. And there isn't, you know, there's not a pet, there's not a private car running on fossil fuel there, you know. Um, so it, it's entirely possible. Um, and there are moves in the UK, particularly uh, Manchester is a good example, which has a really, you know, it's quite a progressive uh, in, it's building its integrated transport system, as is Cambridge. So, um, yeah, there are, it is possible. Yeah, and if you can do it in Freiburg, I was a student there in the late 70s, and, and wow. they had trams and cars and bicycles then, but they also had some extremely old medieval buildings, and yet somehow they've still managed to bring the cobbled streets together with a modern sustainable city. So it shows, shows that, that, it, that it in fact can be done, doesn't it? It is. Um, and, and I should just, sorry, if I may, I'm sorry, yeah. just to say that um, uh, if you look at One Planet Living objectives and indeed the United Nations 17 sustainability objectives, culture, heritage, the historic built environment is actually a really, really key important part of, of social sustainability simply because it acts as an enormous resource and amenity. It, it brings beauty to the built environment. It also uh, tells us where we're going. Unless you know where we've been, you know, you can't really kind of point the way forward. So it's, an, it's very important to have these kind of, uh, not as museum pieces, but as kind of present in our built environment, history serving a really active role, a purpose of its functioning, not, not, not mothballed, but actually, you know, kind of part of our, our approach. And I think this is something that in, in Germany, they do this very well. Mm, absolutely. Uh, and, and just maybe uh, probably the last one now, um, a grand design, John. Which grand designs project do you think is the best example of sustainable building? <laughs> <laughs> We've had many. Um, I'm, I'm always keen on those projects which look ordinary and affordable and which are within the reach of people. Um, uh, and yet a kind of zero carbon or energy producing building. So, you know, the self-eating house that was in the current series that we just finished um, really sort of belongs in the realm of the experimental scientist. There's no doubt, you know, and in the future, it, we'll, we'll see something, but I, I wouldn't ask everybody to go out and try and build one. And I wouldn't ask people to go out and be Ben Law in the woods because to do that involves engaging in civil disobedience and trying to fight your way through planning and becoming an underwoodsman making charcoal in the forest in Sussex. We're not all gonna do that. So the, the stuff that we're filming in Graben Hill, that is exciting because they are low carbon custom built homes. That is, I, I think, that's where it, it's, we should be going. Affordable, passive house, energy positive building. That, that, would, be, uh, that would be very exciting. And occasionally we get one of those. Well, we do have two minutes still. Um, and this is a big question, but uh, we, we've got, uh, I think we've got quite a few architect students on and, and, and they're wondering uh, what role they can play in a, in a sort of COVID future and will it, Will the role of the architect change in a world of COVID-19? I can't believe it will, because there will always be a need to, and a drive to uh, improve our world. And if anything comes out of the current experience, it is that our homes sometimes are woefully ill provided for in, in looking after us, that um, the built environment probably in terms of the internal experience of it, our, our living in buildings, probably matters more to all of us now than it ever did because we see the shortcomings of our homes and we see, we can desire more, we can, we, and actually people are experimenting with their homes, trying stuff out, you know. Um, 
So no, I think actually the desire for architecture, for architects working in the domestic environment is going to be greater than ever coming out of COVID. And I think when we, if you're looking to the adaptation of building, the retrofitting of buildings, the, uh, the demand in the workspace for increasing flexibility, uh, again, architects have an important role. But fundamentally, I come back to the point that architecture is something that we all, in a way, we we all do, we all engage with the design process as individuals. Every time we choose a tie, you and I choose not to choose a tie. Um, or when we plan a meal and that the design process is something which is around all of us every day of our lives. It's just that architects and designers are very good at doing it very quickly. They're trained to short, you know, to, to, to fast track that process. They know how to take a, a roughly formed idea, a lump of coal and, and polish it into a diamond. You know of an idea they know how to take raw ingredients and make a syllabub in 20 minutes in the oven things we can't do and and so taking the aspirations of society and making them manifest i think that's that's it may not be absolutely of the essence right now in this moment but in a year hence i say just wait because i think if if, if we're going to come out of this in a healthy way, it's going to see, I, I hope, a, a, a reinvigoration of people's desire to improve their lives, which is what you know, drives the, the whole design process in the first place. Well, that seems a, a great note to finish on, optimistic note, perhaps, uh, for the future. So uh, thanks enormously to uh, Kevin and, and Joe for making this possible. Thank you. Goodbye. Thank you.